Good morning. Christ is risen. He is risen Hallelujah. What a great day it is. We are beginning today a new five-week series called Complete Joy. It's based in 1 John's and John's letter there. And uh, you'll find that phrase today as we go through it in the lesson and unpack it a little more. And we look forward to sharing that with you as we go on. And the second announcement that I have for you is just to save the date. The 21st of this month at 2 o'clock is the installation of Pastor Tyler Cronkite. We look forward to that. If you're able to make that and celebrate with us and welcome Tyler we look forward to that time together. And those are all the announcements. It is great to be with you on this day. I invite you now to stand, greet someone around you, and we'll begin our worship.
make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Jesus told them, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. God has raised Jesus to life, and we are all we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and sin that so easily entangles. I now invite you to sit or kneel as you are able for a time of self-examination. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you and offered you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I announce for all of us that our sins are forgiven through the grace of the Father, the sacrifice of the Son, and the sanctification of the Spirit. With repentant hearts, we can go forth in joy with our burden of sin lifted. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We rise and join in singing the hymn of praise.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, we find ourselves in the locked doors of ourselves, just as the disciples were behind closed doors. We too are afraid, perhaps for different reasons than theirs, but we too need the breath of the Holy Spirit to take away our fears so that we can come out from behind these locked doors into the joy we know in your resurrection. Lord, we are like Thomas with our questions and our doubts. We sometimes need to see in order to believe. We need you in order to have faith. Lord, just as Thomas confessed you are his Lord and his God, we boldly claim the joy of that statement for ourselves. Lord, we thank you for the blessing you have given us, the ones who believe without seeing. Lord, may the doors of our churches be open to all that doubters may be welcomed here. In the name of our resurrected Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our epistle reading this morning can be found in 1 John at the beginning. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him, to walk in the same way in which he walked. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. We rise for the Alleluia in verse. <laughs> Alleluia. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Alleluia. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Alleluia. The Holy 
Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We join together and profess our Christian faith through the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men. Please be seated and we join in singing the hymn of the day.
I use the term this morning, green screen, I would assume many of you know what that is, but not all of you know what that is. Uh, for those who don't, it's a cinematic technique, and what it does is it allows you to replace the background in a picture or in a movie with something else, and I want to show you an example. This first slide is the green screen. Obviously, you could guess where the name came from, but that color, uh, the computers allow you to draw that color away from whatever is in front of it and replace it, and this is what it looks like replaced. So, you can put anything behind someone, put them in outer space, put them underwater, whatever it is. Um, I say that because often when Sarah and I are watching a, a TV show or a movie or something, we'll both look at each other and say, green screen, uh, and we'll laugh because what we mean is what we're seeing we know is not real. In fact, you can kind of tell uh, by the outline of the person, it's a little funky right now still. I'm sure they'll perfect that. But I say all that so that we understand something, because this is really a part of our world right now. AI technology, artificial intelligence technology, I'm sure you've heard of that. And it can pretty much create anything. I've seen it create people, they still look a little odd, but it, they can do it. Research papers, cartoon images, music, voices, instruments, they can do all of that, and none of it is real. And I throw this out this morning because there's a gap that now exists in our world, and especially with our young people, on what is real versus what is made up. And we need to understand this because, you know, kind of the norms of thought process and logic that we all went through in terms of receiving information and how you calculate and process it are out the window. The issue no longer is, as Pontius Pilate said, what is truth. The issue today is what is real. And so this is the challenge for us as believers in our world today. But I say that because this is exactly what John is writing and trying to convey to the early church in his letters. He wants them to understand that all of this, everything that they've written about Jesus is real. So I want to set the stage first for this letter that we're going to look at over the next five weeks. First of all, it has been 60 years since the resurrection of Jesus. And the church has grown, and the church has been established, and the church has been through and continues to be through persecution. It has been riddled over that time span with false teachers and false teachings, that the writings of Paul and the writings of John and all of the others are often combating in that. The apostles, the 12 disciples, all but John, uh, the author of this letter, have either been martyred for the faith or have died and gone home to be with Jesus. And the time frame that John writes in is from 90 to 100 AD, near the end of this first century. And in this time frame, John will write his gospel that we heard this morning, the Gospel of John. He will write these letters. We have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John that are in the Bible. And he will write the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's kind of the background. You know, communication is a very interesting thing because people communicate in very different ways. And I say this because I love my children dearly, but they communicate very differently from one another. Uh, a couple of years ago, when the hurricanes hit North Carolina, where both my girls live, uh, we called and we texted to ask how they were doing and if they were okay. This is what one of them said to us. There's lots of rain. It really kept coming down so much so fast. The streams were rising quickly. It started overflowing the banks. It was spilling onto the roads. Cars were getting stuck. People were stranded. We were out of power, wondering what was next, so we're coming to stay with you. <laughs> the other one said, it's a lot of water, but we're okay. And I say that because the disciples 
And the writers of the letters that we have in the New Testament are just that different. John is that first one. That's how John writes. Gospel of Mark, I would say, is kind of the second one. He's very terse and gets to the point. But understand this. John has incredible reason. He is just gripped in his soul by what he has experienced, what we celebrated last week in Easter, the resurrection of Jesus. It is so profoundly changed and shaped the lives of the disciples, that they would never, ever be the same. As Pastor Mark likes to say to us often, this changes everything, and it did for them. They went from timid, locked up for fear of the authorities, deserting disciples, to bold, proclaim in the face of all opposition, immovable rocks of faith, testifying to the resurrection. And even in the face of torture and death, imprisonment, whatever would come, nothing would stop them from speaking of what they knew, what they had seen, what they had experienced. For John, the truth and reality of the resurrection, as I said, gripped him the rest of his life. And we can see that in these opening verses of 1 John that he writes to us. I want you to understand something. Those first four verses in this letter, uh, in the original language, in the Greek, are what we would call a run-on sentence. There is no punctuation whatsoever in those first four verses. Kind of like relating a story that you are so excited about that you can't get the words out fast enough because of that excitement. You can't stop talking about it. I say that because I want to try just and capture that for you as it is delivered by John. So here goes. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, which we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. That's how John is writing this. You can almost feel the excitement just pouring onto the page as he's writing that. He has experienced ecstasy and excitement. This is John saying, man, I have got to tell you about this. It's real. We heard it. We saw it. We touched it. And I'm telling you so that you too can catch the wave, so that you too, as John ends that sentence with in that whole group, may have complete joy. That's what we're going to look at over the next five weeks, complete joy. So let's start by asking that question. What is complete joy? What is John kind of talking about? Now, first, I'm going to say what it is not, so we can put our arms around that. It is not merely a fleeting emotion that is dependent upon favorable circumstances in our lives. It is a deep abiding sense of contentment and satisfaction that transcends external situations. It is a joy that is anchored in the eternal truth of God's word, anchored in God's love and grace through a relationship that has been created by the risen, living Jesus. And I wanted to mention one more thing about John's letter uh, that we're going to see often in this. Often John draws in to this letter, 1 John, things that he has written in his gospel, words that Jesus has said, ideas and concepts that he has already put down in black and white for us. For instance, when John writes this section, uh, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sins. Think about that, and I'm going to pull in a couple of verses from John's gospel, the beginning of John's gospel. In him was life, And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And later on in that first section, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world. 
But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Then in John 3, it says this, Jesus says this to Nicodemus, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So John does that a lot. He draws back in these sections uh, and, and concepts and things from his gospel. But back to complete joy. What else is complete joy the result of in our lives? Well, second, it's the very thing that Jesus died on the cross to give us. Fellowship and communion once again with God. And this fellowship that we talk about is in no way like our fellowship with one another in our life because this fellowship is a transcendent, profound fellowship with the eternal. Uh, and it only grows deeper, as John says, as by walking in the light, Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that this complete joy that comes from walking in the light of Jesus permeates our lives in all ways. You know, John goes on and he understands that and he begins to talk for us as believers the things that we have to do, the pitfalls of our lives, uh, and, and wants us to understand that even in the midst of that, the, the things that happen to us, that complete joy of Jesus because it is eternal is still there for us. That's why he says uh, these words, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. John uses that word advocate. Advocate is a legal term. It is one who is speaking on our behalf in a courtroom. And so what John is saying is this is Jesus who speaks on our behalf in the courtroom in front of the eternal judge of all creation. And what Jesus is saying is this, I know Steve is guilty, but I've paid the price for him. I took his sin on me. But it isn't an adversarial role, role, understand that, with the judge either, because the judge doesn't stand in opposition to this advocate who speaks on our behalf. Because remember, the eternal judge loves us so much that he sent his one and only son into this world to redeem us. He wants the guilty to be forgiven, but there was a price that had to be paid for our sin, and Jesus, our advocate, is the one who paid that for us. So John wants us to know, even when that happens, this advocate working for us yields for us complete joy. And finally, eternal perspective, I would say, has to do with complete joy. It's not dependent on current circumstances, as I said at the beginning. It's rooted in these eternal promises and love of Jesus. And so I want to read this next section to you that says, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. And by this, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And I remember after this section, as you heard, uh, read, John says, you know, this is a new commandment, but it's an old commandment, but it's a new commandment. And then there's all these back and forth comparisons with dark and light and truth and lying. And what John is bringing in in this is what Jesus said to his disciples. A new commandment I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And that's the commandment that John's talking about in this section. And he says, showing that love uh, in our lives, and he uses the word perfected. And perfected in the Greek language is a word teleos. And here's what it means. It means fully mature, but it isn't a stagnant word. It means both arriving at full maturity and also journeying in full maturity. I'll give you an example. 
You go outside and soon we will see beautifully full-grown trees with leaves on them. But they're not dead, they're still living and growing no matter how mature they look to us. And so it means whatever does come our way in life, the circumstances that we have to deal with, we handle them with maturity through the love of Jesus. But never on this side of eternity are we finished in that process. Jesus' love in us shows that maturity, but it's always growing and always moving. As Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. And in that thought process, I want to throw out two words to you, and one of them I know will be very familiar to you. Two words are this, orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Orthodoxy, I'm pretty sure you know. Ortho means right. Doxy has to do with thinking and teaching. Praxy has to do with action. And to boil it down very simply, this is saying and this is doing. And what John is putting together here is that you cannot have one without the other. These two things together are maturity in Christ. I say that because I think we often hear a cry for orthodoxy, right thinking, yet also often it is abandon of orthopraxy, of action. And that's what John is getting at when he says, only saying, I know him, but not acting in love as he did, showing that love, that's not maturity. Maturity is both of these things together, and it takes both of them for love to be complete. Sometimes we talk about, well, we need to guard uh, doctrine, orthodoxy, but I don't know how often you hear anyone say, we need to guard also with doctrine the love of Jesus. You see, John's saying we must do both. Both of these things need to exist in our lives. That new commandment that's the old commandment that's the new commandment has to be part of this if we're going to say, I know him. And that kind of takes me back to the beginning. Our joy is also complete in what we know to be real. And that's what John is conveying to us in this letter to say these are the things that are real. The resurrection of Jesus is real. His forgiveness on the cross is real. His truth spoken to us in his words and commands are real. His advocacy for us, for our sin, is real. But if you and I are going to bridge this new gap that exists in the world over what is real versus what is false, our love from Jesus has to be just as real as what we say we know. It has to be that love that Jesus gives to us in our lives. Our knowledge and love need to share equal footings in our lives. And John's saying, and when we fail in that, when we fail to show that love in our lives, we don't run and hide from it. We expose it. We expose our sin. We expose our failures in the light in Jesus. We confess it so that the light of Jesus can change us also, profoundly change us, as it did John, as it did the disciples. Because knowing and loving like Jesus, that's what yields for us in our lives, complete joy. So we're going to talk about this over the next couple of weeks, and we're going to continue to expand these verses in 1 John, always coming back to complete joy that we have in Jesus, our Savior. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you that complete joy is found in you, in the relationship that you created in us through your love and through your grace and through your word of truth. Lord, help us always to remember that the maturity that you grow in us through your word is maturity that both knows but also acts in the love that you showed to us, selfless love that reaches so that that love that flows into us from you may overflow to those around us, that they too may be impacted and profoundly changed by all you came into this world to do and all that you continue to do. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. And we continue with the song.
Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious Lord, the ones you love are ill and need your healing care. Especially we remember Ryder Finkel, Dave Peck, Mary McCullman, Laura Tom, Rick Webster, the son-in-law of Dale and Susan McGorman, Lynn Hubar and Rosie, and those who we name in our hearts at this time. Touch them with your healing hand, Lord, in your mercy. <coughs> Merciful God, we remember the faithful who have gone before us and now rest from their labors. We ask for peace and comfort to the family and friends of Matt, a recent West Michigan Christ Christian high school graduate. Grant that we may follow in faith where they have led the way and at length be brought with them into your everlasting light and life to see you face to face. Lord, in your mercy. All-powerful God, we pray for your strength and guidance as we go through the leadership nomination process for those you seek to lead us in this congregation. Through your spirit, motivate those among us to serve. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, we give thanks for the students who have completed the First Communion class this weekend. Make them and all of us who partake of your Holy Supper mindful of your forgiveness that comes to us through your body and blood. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We rise for the preface. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the very Paschal Lamb who was offered for us and has taken away the sins of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has given us complete joy in the promise of everlasting life. Therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Jesus Christ, the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, and the peace of our Lord be with you always. Thank you. I invite you to be seated.
We pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed and renewed us through the healing power of this gift of life that comes to us through your body and blood. And we pray that in your forgiving mercy you would strengthen us through this gift in our faith in you and in abiding love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our resurrected Lord. Amen. Now receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We join in singing our closing hymn.